I've got that in the slideshow too. But um, yeah, LinkedIn is where I'm most active on social media. I hate Facebook. We we do have a company Facebook page, um, reluctantly. Uh, I'm active on uh, Twitter somewhat, but LinkedIn is the place where I'm most active and where I get the most engagement. So yeah, um, what Mark was talking about is, is mostly on, on LinkedIn. Um, and it's not, uh, I don't know if I've posted about changing the, your filters, Shannon, but I definitely, the other day I posted about uh, flushing your water heater because <laughs> I did that a couple of weeks ago. All right, That's can everybody- right. Thank you for that yeah. reminder. Yeah, can everybody see this? The title slide looks great. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about duct design for low static air handlers. Now, a lot of people are scared of low static air handlers, but before we get into that, um, anybody who uh, is here tonight and doesn't know me and saw my name, maybe Googled Allison and uh, was wondering what I look like. Um, this is what you, what you get if you Google the name Allison. Um, I'm not any of those people though. Although I am in who's who of American women. One time somebody asked me if it's because I used to be a woman and no, it's not, not that there's anything wrong with that, but no. Um, so anyway, let's talk about um, duct work first. Before we get into low static air handlers, let's talk about duct work. And you know, why, why even talk about duct design and low static air handlers? Because I mean, you know, duct, ducts, I mean, we know how to do ducts, right? Look at this system. Uh, FlexDuck does everything we need it to do. So why should we bother with anything else? That's just a beautiful system right there. It won't work with crap, but it looks nice, right? FlexDuck, you can turn the air on a dime. And if you don't have a dime, you can turn it on a nickel. It's, uh, it's really good at, at doing stuff that, that hard pipe can't do, like squeezing in tight places. You know, hard pipe can't do that. Uh, yeah, sometimes there is problems with flex duct, but look, let me show you the advantage of a flex duct, even a situation like this, because, you know, yeah, it's been torn down by some critters in the crawl space, but you see that wire, that's the helical wire that keeps the uh, shape of the flex duct, and it's still attached to the boot, and that's guiding the air to the boot. That's, that's the path of least resistance right there. That's how the air gets to the boot. Um, another advantage of flex duct is uh, you can uh, make the air really quiet by cutting the airflow down to next to nothing <laughs> by putting an extra length. And you don't have to take extra duct back with you on the truck when you're done installing. In the South, dehumidification is a big thing. And one way to do dehumidification is to cool the air down, make it really, really cold, and then reheat it, the reheat system. This is a reheat system in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, very inexpensive reheat right here. You just staple the flex duct up right under the, the roof deck. Lots of reheat there. Of course, we want ducts inside the enclosure and everybody thinks you have to use hard pipe for that, but hey, you can do it with flex duct too. Plumbers love flex duct, as does everybody. You know what plumbers call flex duct? Knee pads. <laughs> I heard you all laughing in my head. Um, so the... Uh, uh, you know, when you design a duct system, it has to be absolutely clear which way the air is going, where it's coming from, where it's going to. And um, if anybody can figure this out, please let me know. But it's always easy to retrofit it. If it doesn't work, you can just chop it off and tape it up with duct tape. And you can, uh, you can use things like um, downspout from your gutter system. You can use a piece of cord lying around. You can use trash bags, you know, um, boots and suspenders here, double tie it on there. Hard pipe, of course, um, some people think is the answer. This was a hard pipe system I took apart. Well, I didn't take it apart. I took the insulation off. It fell apart by itself. Um, the insulation was what was holding it together. Here's a hard pipe system. Again, very confusing. I think the, uh, the reason for this is somebody didn't want to take the uh, stuff back to the shop with them uh, or they wanted to use up a bunch of fittings. I'm not sure, but it, this makes no sense at all. So um, if your brain is hurting, mine is too. And, uh, you know, looking at that brain kind of reminds me of flex duct, actually. But let's, uh, let's calm down. Um, this will make everybody feel better, a monkey petting a bird. I mean, look how cute that thing is. Look at those little fingers. Oh, man. Let's leave it there for about five minutes. Take a deep breath. Okay, let's go. Um, all right, let's get into some of the real stuff here. So... One of the things about low static air handlers that a lot of people believe, and um, 
this this is common. I've had a lot of people say this. You know, you, you can't put too much duct work on a low static air handler because it just doesn't have the the oomph to push that air through a lot of a long duct system. And that's not true. Here's the duct plan for my house. There are two low static um, duct systems uh, in the attic. So here's one for the um, the bedroom side of the house, and that's a fair amount of ductwork over there. One return, and then a bunch of supplies with a trunk line. The part of the house, the main part of the house over here, has a, a bigger air handler. Um, same, same, ready for same static pressure. It's a Mitsubishi SEZ unit, and uh, rated for 0.2 inch of uh, water column, static pressure, which is pretty low. Standard air handlers are rated for 0.5 or 0.6. Uh, so 0.2 is really low, which means you have to have a really good duct system to make it work. And some people would look at this and say, oh, there's no way all that duct work on a low static air handler is ever going to work. They're wrong because it does work. This is in my house. I know it works because I've lived with it for two years now. And it's great. Um, so why does it work? That's the question. We want to know, um, oops, let me do this. Um, we need to know why it works. And the reason it works is that, um, oops, let's see here. The reason it works is that I am a juggler and duct design is really nothing but juggling. You've, you've got some different things to juggle to make it work. Uh, the first thing is pressure. Pressure is only one factor in the equation. And, and when people say you can't put too much duct work on a low static air handler, they're thinking that pressure is the only thing that matters. But pressure is not the only thing that matters. Um, pressure comes from the blower and, you know, um, HVAC guys are, are usually, um, they're used to working with, with big blowers that have a lot of pressure, uh, you know, a lot of force and can move the air um, with high, higher pressure. But in you know, passive house and high performance homes, there are these things called uh, variable capacity, mini split heat pumps. Um, and yes, you can get them with, with higher static pressure. And a lot of, we, we do a fair number of our designs with the higher static versions of these because we don't always have control over what the contractors and the installers are gonna do with the duct system. Uh, so we often will go with the higher static units, but the, the low static units are great. They use less energy. Um, you just have to make sure the ducts are gonna work with them. Um, so in residential systems, it starts with the blower. You pick a blower and then you design your duct system around that. The, the opposite of um, commercial systems and commercial system, you design your duct system and then you figure out what blower you need to go with it. But in residential, you pick the blower first and then design the duct system. So the juggling happens by looking at the other factors. And one of those is the airflow rate. The, uh, the, the blower has a you know, pressure rating and for each pressure, there will be an airflow and that airflow uh, and the pressure go together. So the CFM and the, the um, static pressure go together. They're determined by the, the air handler. But you also put a duct system on there, unless it's a ductless unit. And there's a couple of things that affect your ability to move the air, the amount of air that you want to the places where you want it. One is the resistance of the air against the surface on the inside of the ductwork. And um, so you, 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 know, you can put it through sheet metal, which is nice and smooth. You can put it through rigid ductboard with the fiberglass on the inside, and that's not very smooth. And there will be a lot of resistance there. You can put it through flex duct, and that may be nice and smooth, or it may be rough, depending on how it's installed. The um, flex duct, of course, the inner liner needs to be pulled really tight to make it nice and smooth on the inside. And when you do that, it works almost as well as, as hard pipe, but that doesn't often happen. Um, the other factor that matters for resistance in the duct system is turbulence. So when you turn the air, when you split the air, when you put things into the airstream like dampers, the um, you build up turbulence in the airflow and that also slows down the air. So that's a, those are pressure drops, things that change the pressure. And a fourth factor that we juggle in the duct design process is the um, 
velocity because the you know the the duck size and the velocity go together a bigger duck is going to have a lower velocity if you don't change anything else a smaller duck will have a higher velocity a higher velocity will be noisier so no noise is definitely a consideration sometimes and so we've got to factor that in and let's uh so, so of, of those four factors now the, the resistance is the the um the big one so in manual d which is the air conditioning contractors of america protocol for designing duct system the uh, the way we uh, characterize the resistance in a duct system is this thing called total effective length which has two components the equivalent length and the total effective length. Now, notice there's, there's two different words there, equivalent length and effective length, but they're used differently. Equivalent length is, is just for the fittings. That's the resistance in a fitting. And it's it's the, the pressure drop in the fitting that's a, uh, equivalent to the pressure drop in a certain straight length of ductwork. So if you have a fitting and it says the pressure drop or the, the equivalent length is 30 feet, that means the pressure drop of the air going through that fitting, fitting is equivalent to the pressure drop in 30 feet of straight duct. Um, so that's, uh, when you add up all of the equivalent lengths of the fittings to the, the, the lengths of the straight ducts, then you get the total effective length. And that number gets calculated into something called the friction rate. We're not going to go into those details, but you've got to get the available static pressure, the total effective length, then you calculate the friction rate, and that tells you whether you have a good duct system or not. So. Um, fittings are, are where the action is at. And so going back to you know, the myth that you can't uh, put a, too long of a duct system on a low static air handler, it's not the actual length that matters, it's the total effective length. Um, and the fittings determine that way more than the actual length of the duct system. So here's an example of takeoffs from a trunk line. So if you're doing these different kind of takeoffs, you can see that there's a table here and we don't need to go into all the details of it, but the, uh, the, there's different kinds of takeoffs and, and where they're positioned on the trunk line has an effect. So if you look through here, you can see, you know, the low end of this is 20 feet. So that one fitting, that one takeoff on the trunk line is 20 feet. Um, or you could choose a really bad one that's 90 or 95 feet. So that, that one fitting is equivalent to 90 or 95 feet of, a, uh, of straight duct. That's horrible. That's horrible. Um, and here are boots. Boots are the, the transition piece between a, a, a duct run and where the vent is in the room. Um, and again, we've got some that are really low. We've got some 10 foot equivalent lengths here, and we've got a 90 foot. So if you, if you want to do a, a low static air handler, you've got to pay attention to these numbers and you want to go for the good fittings. There's some elbows and um, again, you know, it depends on uh, you know, what kind of elbow it is and what, um, what the uh, ratio is of the, the radius of curvature to the diameter of the duct. So uh, those are elbows. So if anybody's getting freaked out, here's a picture of a hummingbird in my backyard. This is a male ruby-throated hummingbird. You can see the nice ruby throat there. I love hummingbirds. I'm tracking the last day that I see them because they migrate. They, these little guys are amazing. They go all the way down to Mexico and Central America. These little tiny little things flapping their wings a thousand miles a minute, a uh, thousand beats a second, whatever it is. Anyway, um, hummingbirds. Let's talk about elbows, because this is where you have a big opportunity to, to make an improvement. Now, some people looking at this might think, hey, look at that nice radius turn, okay? Um, that's the heel right here. This part is called the heel. So here's some HAC duct installer terminology for you. The outer part of an elbow is called the heel. The inner part is called the throat. One of those parts is more important than the other. And it's not the one that looks nice here. Um, the, you know, a lot of people are, are looking at this nice curve, but this is really what determines whether it's a good fitting or not. And here's how you can think about that. Have you ever seen a racetrack, NASCAR, Indy, whatever, where they have uh, sharp 90 degree turns? No, 
because what would happen, you know, th think about the air as, as race cars going through the here. If an, uh, the air is coming through this way and it's got to make this turn, is it going to just make a sharp 90 degree turn? No, it's going to shoot out this way and then turn, which means this whole area is, is you know, there's going to be a bunch of turbulence in here. And uh, so this air is going to crash into the air coming down here. So it's a mess. So you don't want a sharp throat. You want a nice radius on the throat like this. This is a house I saw in Toronto, and that looks pretty nice. Here's another one. This is in my house. This is the, uh, the nice radius throat. Uh, the, you know, it, it's good to have the, the radius on the heel too, but when you're looking at elbows, always look at the throat first. That's, that's more important than the heel. So fittings dominate pressure drops. Um, and th that's why the uh, this myth is not true because the, you know the the most of the resistance is coming in the fittings, not in the straight duct. So put in good fittings and do your duct design right, and you can have a low static unit that works perfectly. Poorly installed flex. You know, you know we, when we're talking about fittings, usually we're thinking of hard pipe, but sometimes people do everything with flex duct and they turn it and split it with flex duct and everything. So you've got to. Uh, factor that in it's hard to know what the equivalent lengths are for some of the stuff they do with with flex duct like you know what's the total effective length of this mess right here now that's hard to know all right so let's see um this is the system in our office so this is a 12k one ton mitsubishi sez unit right up here the air handlers right up there we got a transition piece here going to a, a filter right here and then we've got a, a big radius turn right here. And again, there's the throat, nice radius throat with a good radius of curvature relative to the diameter of the duct. So um, low equivalent length, low pressure drop, uh, radius turn there. And I measured the, the uh, total external static pressure that tells you what, uh, how good it is. And the system is ready for 0.2. It's running at 0.0. 09, 0.09. So we're only halfway to the, the pressure that we could have used. So we've got a really good duct system on this. Now this one is pretty short and I don't have the, the uh, schematic for this duct system in the presentation, but it is a fairly short duct system compared to the ones at my house. But, um, and that was uh, that uh, 0.09 inch of water column static pressure was with this airflow. So 363 CFM cubic feet per minute of air, total airflow, which is about what it's rated for. So we were getting full airflow. This was the pressure drop across the filter, 0.06. So really good. We'll talk about filters some more. I've got another myth coming up and uh, we'll talk about filters there. So this is, this is one of the air handlers in my house and you can see the, um, the air handler here, the return, the trunk line. So here's the, uh, the, the main supply trunk coming out and it splits and I've got a picture of that so you can see the nice radius turns there. The, what I call the pair of pants T. Uh, well, I didn't make up that name. It's been in the industry for a while. Um, but this is a ducted, ducted mini split rated for 0.2 inch of water column. And we usually design for lower velocities. The ACA manual D um, protocol says, you know, designed for up to 900 feet per minute. Uh, if you design for lower velocity, the pressure drops are lower at lower velocity. There's, uh, that helps with your uh, duct system. It means bigger ducts though to design for lower velocity. It also means if you're not designing for this low velocity, you should make sure that your ducts are in conditioned space or semi-conditioned space, minor in an encapsulated attic. Uh, if you were putting them into well, nobody would ever put them into an unconditioned attic, right? <laughs> Actually, the people who put them in unconditioned attics usually don't do real design, so they're not on this program. So um, here's what the uh, what that looks like. So in this diagram, so this part right here is what that next picture is. So here's the, the air handler, the plenum, and one, one part comes out and this was during installation. So it's not finished yet. So this one's not attached to anything over there and it's not insulated at this point. But the, uh, the nice radius uh, throat on both of them. And so we get good even split of the air there and um, 
low static pressure. This was on the return side. You've seen this one before. So works really well. And the static pressure, the total external static pressure on this is 0.13. So a little bit higher than the one at the office, but you know there's more ductwork here, more fittings you'd expect it. But still, it's rated for 0.2, and we're running at 0.13. Hey, I'll take it. And um, what I haven't told you yet is that I'm not running with the thin little filters that Mitsubishi sends you. I throw those away with the ducted systems. Um, and I use real uh, MERV 13 high efficiency filters, which gets us to myth number two. Um, you can't use high MERV filters on low static air handlers. Well, some HVAC people think you can't use high MERV filters on anything. <laughs> but that's not true. This uh, system at our office, 0.09 inch of water column static pressure, that's with a MERV 13 filter. Um, when I took the filter out, uh, you can see it's at about 0.05. So point about 0 0.4, uh, 0 0.04 of the, the pressure drop was was for the filter. 0 0.04 across the MERV 13 filter. That's pretty darn good. This is my house. This is, um, we got ceiling grills here. They're two inches deep. The one at the office is four inches deep and um, works great. So when I first installed this, I was getting a pressure drop across the filters of uh, 0.08 inch of water column, which is pretty good. ACCA, ACCA says to uh, um, put in 0.1 inch of water column for pressure drops across filters. And they're talking about the like the MERV 2 filters that uh, are usually installed. So I'm getting 0.08 with a MERV 13 filter. But I was not happy with that um, because here's the problem. Uh, well, I'll get to the problem in a minute. I'll show you how I improved it. But first, how I got to you know, this low a pressure was a simple rule. Well, we, uh, in our design, used two square feet of filter area for each 400 CFM of airflow. So two square feet per ton, basically. The 400 CFM is nominally a ton of airflow. Uh, you know, it's the airflow for one ton of capacity. And so the two square feet, as they say down here, is just the, the length times the width of the filter. That does not include the, all the pleats. It doesn't include the stretched out area of the filter fabric. That's just length times width for the frame of the filter. And that gets us uh, a low pressure drop across the filter. If you're wondering about face velocity, some of you more technical people out there, um, two square feet per ton is about 200 feet per minute of face velocity. And filters are usually tested at about 500 feet of face velocity. Lower velocity through the filter usually means better filtration as well. So other thing. So here's what I was talking about, the, um, what I didn't like. So when, when they first installed the system, I didn't pay attention to this part. But my two-inch filter goes in this gap up here, which meant this piece of sheet metal was right on the back side of my filter. And you know, the, the duct goes in, and so a lot of the air was going straight through the middle of the filter and, and not as much through this part. Although the filter did look uniformly dirty, so some of it was going through the edges, but if I'd left it longer, I probably would have had a nice round circle of dirt in the filter. Um, you, need, you need space behind the filter, and ideally you want about six inches of space. So I had this retrofitted. So I had this piece of sheet metal taken off and I had a big box put on the backside. So this is way more than six inches. I got about 20 inches, I think. And um, my, uh, uh, so six inches space. Um, so my pressure drop across the filter went from about 0.08 to about 0.06. So I got about a 30% drop or 30% decrease in my pressure drop just by putting this big box on the back of the filter, giving it more space. What, what that does, remember earlier I talked about turbulence being one of the factors that, that hurts your airflow. When you put a lot of space back there, it reduces the amount of turbulence that's, that's happening in the airflow back there. Um, so some other information about filter grills versus cabinet filters. At our office, we have a cabinet filter. Um, at my house, I have filter grills and cabinet filters uh, usually close to the air handler um, 
sometimes, well, as I say, maybe harder to change cabinet filters, especially if the installer does something stupid like run the condensate line right in front of the, the access panel so you can't pull the filter out. I've seen plenty of pictures like that. Or, or worse than the condensate line because PVC is easy to change or easier to change than copper. I've also seen uh, copper lines uh, or gas line running right in front of the filter access. So, um, one advantage of the cabinet filters, though, it's easier to get a thicker filter. You can do four inch filters on, on filter grills, but uh, two inch filters usually are easier to do for filter grills. Filter grills uh, are in the living space, not in an attic or a crawl space. Um, so they're often easier to get to um, and check. And they also keep the return ducts clean because if you put the the uh, filter near the air handler, all the ductwork before that filter is uh, uh, running dirty air through it. And, uh, you know, dirt will build up in that duct system, uh, you know, in that part of the duct. Uh, I mean, is it a big deal? Not really, because as long as you get it filtered out before it goes in and gets redistributed to the house, but it, it does build up and it's better to not let it build up, you know, get that on the filter and just get it all out of the house. Um, one thing that you have to do, though, with filter grills is you have to make sure the return duct is super tight because any leaks in that return duct between the filter and the air handler is going to be sucking in air that doesn't get filtered. So that part, that the, the whole return duct has to be really sealed absolutely tight so you don't suck in dirt there because that's under negative pressure. All right. Um, how am I doing on time? I'm at the summary already. Did I go too fast? Too slow? Good. That's okay. right. All right. Good. So let's do a little summary here. So total effective length matters more than the total length. So that myth number one is, is just not true. You can put long duct systems, a lot of duct work on low static air handlers. You just have to pay really close attention to the, to the fittings because that's where most of the resistance is coming from and the filters because the, um, the available static pressure that you get is the, the, the rated static pressure, like the 0.2, minus the pressure drops of the non-duct items, like the filter and dampers and, and things like that. So you subtract those off first. And the filter is usually the biggest one of those. And then the fittings provide the most resistance in the duct components. So pay attention to those, and you can get a, a good performance with a low static air handler. The fittings contribute the most. And high MERV filtration is possible with enough filter area. So these are the, the three main takeaways. And here's my little monkey on a dog. Another cute little monkey. Yay. <laughs> uh, my blog, energyvanguard.com. And uh, I write new articles every week. I have a newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter and get that once a week. Uh, I have links to the new articles. I have a weekly column in there. And, um, that's the end.